My question to you, the first question is, what are some really common reasons that people hit plateaus in their weight loss journey? So plateaus and recidivism are slightly different, but it's they, they're related and that's a good question. Plateaus are typically due to um, metabolic adaptation and a misunderstanding of what's actually going on. So metabolic adaptation, the way that your body fights weight loss is through two main mechanisms. Most people have this misunderstanding that it's going to really lower your metabolic rate, and it doesn't do that. If you look at the data surrounding drops in metabolic rate from what it should be as a predicted level. If you lose 25 pounds, we use a predictive equation. We say this is what a person who's 155 pounds should be. If you look at somebody that went from 180 pounds to 155 pounds, they're typically only off from those predictive equations between five and 25 calories. So these metabolic rate drops aren't really the causes of these stalls. And I wanna put that out first because if we know that that's not the cause, then we can actually start to focus on what is important. And so what we find with metabolic adaptation, this is the body's main um, mechanism for preventing you from losing weight. And you have to think about this from a biological perspective. Our body doesn't wanna lose weight. It doesn't realize that we're in the 21st century. We have calories you know, that are in such abundance it's amazing. We think that we're still in caves. We're foraging. Yes, we're... my husband definitely thinks he's still in a cave. And he's got the beard to prove it. <laughs> and so it, it, we think that we're in this position where food could become scarce at any time. And so biologically, the way that we evolved was our body said, okay, I need to prevent myself from losing weight. But what's funny is it doesn't seem to work in the opposite direction because gaining extra weight was always a good thing because if you put on body fat, you had that extra ability mm. to have that for when times became scarce. Do you think so in the way that... So I think about um, myself or my sister. Very active, we move a lot, right? I mm. am a fidgeter, I'm always moving. I think it would be very difficult for me to put on weight and to put on say body fat and I look at, you know, my producer Matt over here, I think it would be really difficult to um, change that baseline. Is that, do you think that there is, is truth to that? Is that just something that potentially I made up? So what you're getting at is one of the two mechanisms that our bodies use to prevent, it's part of that metabolic adaptation that uses to prevent that weight loss. The two ways that, that it really affects us, one are hunger levels ramp up. And so people who are stalled technically are probably just not following their diet as close as they thought that they were. They're either having tracking errors or they're simply binging more than they thought that they were and causing themselves to go into a calorie surplus. Two, and what you're kind of hinting at, <clears throat> neat levels, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, all of that movement that we do that is not dedicated exercise slows down. And this is one of our body's main ways to prevent that loss in weight. You stop fidgeting, you stop walking around, you stay on the couch a little bit more. And so this can really drop total daily energy expenditure to the point that people's weight loss progress stalls out. And you know, one of the ways that we tell people to help adjust for this is, this is where we use step count as a proxy of need. Now, obviously there's no easy way in a free living person to say, hey, you know, how is this person's need levels going to be, um, you know, moving up and down based off of other types of movement? You know, we can't monitor what, how much you're moving your arms, really. We can't monitor how much you're fidgeting, really, but we can monitor step, step count. And so one of the best ways to be able to see as a person's losing weight what the cause of their stall may be is to monitor step count. And if you see, hey, you know, in the beginning, when we started, you were at 9,000 steps per day. And now that you've lost 20 pounds, all of a sudden you're at 6,500 and you can no longer lose weight and we have not adjusted your calorie intakes from food. Well, there you go. There's, there's one of the reasons that it's happened because your total daily energy expenditure has dropped. Mm. And so when you're talking about it's very difficult for you to gain weight because you are an active person, you you fidget, you move around a lot, you've got an active lifestyle. I mean, NEAT can, can, uh, can account for up to 2,000 extra calories per day. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a now, lot. that's not the average person. That's somebody that's in, say, an agricultural job. And is there, before you, uh, before you continue, do you think that there is a body set point? 
that even though if we're living, and I know this is somewhat hypothetical, but even though we're living in an obesogenic environment, do you think that, for example, how much you weigh? I weigh 225 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you had to get that special chair for me. A small human. <laughs> um, do you think that your body would prefer to be, say, for example, 225 pounds? So <clears throat> the, there's there's a couple theories about this. It's a very interesting question, actually. There's the um, there's the body fat set point theory, but the one that I would recommend people look into is something called dual intervention point model. And dual intervention point model suggests that there are both environmental and genetic factors that come into play for your 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 body fat essential set point. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly believe that yes, there there are influencing factors that are both genetic and environmental that keep people where they roughly are or you know where their body roughly wants them to be and it's difficult to change and this works in both directions you know it's difficult for people to gain weight that have these really active lifestyles like you were saying it's difficult to lose weight for these people that have these really sedentary lifestyles and whose bodies have um you know this this predetermined notion that they need to be at this certain weight and part of it that is controlled a lot through um, hunger cues, you know, and discordant hunger cues are one of the really big problems that a lot of people have. Can you explain? Yeah. Explain, explain what that is. Well, we know that through, um, information from the NIH, uh, Kevin Hall does a lot of these great things that talks about the calories in versus calories out energy balance models that calories in versus calories out is essentially the guiding principle between the, of why you would either gain weight or lose weight. Right. So not the carbohydrate insulin model. No, that's <laughs> that's been roughly debunked for a long period of time. So if, if we know that this is the guiding principle, when we test it, it seems to hold true. If you take an obese person and you put them into the calorie deficit that they should be in, they lose weight. However, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. And there are a lot of things that particularly obese people, particularly people that have dysregulated emotions, dysregulated hunger cues, dysregulated um, ability to cope with these types of stressors that they're facing, their challenge is much higher than say you or me whose bodies naturally want to be a little bit lighter. I mean, when I started lifting weights, I, I started lifting weights because I was like you. I was six foot one and 165 pounds. And so I was like- that, I got that's, um, that's, I think, pretty- thin -ish. yeah yeah for that height it's absolutely thin and so these discordant hunger cues can be a real problem for these people that are trying to lose weight and particularly maintain that weight loss and what you were talking about earlier with the 80 percent recidivism rate there's one extremely big reason for that and this is again work out of the nih with kevin hall that was very interesting he found that when you have weight loss in a situation if you go from say 200 pounds to 150 pounds and you compare yourself to another 150 pound person who had always been 150 mm -hmm. pounds, for the people that have lost weight, you have an extra drive for 100 calories of food every day for every kilogram lost. Okay, and so you have, so for every 2.2 pounds lost, there's a drive to feed. 100 feet. extra calories per day. Okay, that's a lot. So you have, the same outcomes will work, the same procedures will work, you know, if, if it's it, roughly, if it's, you know, 1500 calories or whatever it is to, to maintain for that one person, it's gonna be the similar for this other person, assuming neat and all of these other things are, are maintained, right? Mm -hmm. But the person that lost the weight is going to be experiencing much greater hunger cues throughout. So the recidivism rate is not surprising because people are unaware of this. And they're unaware of the fact that they're dealing with something that somebody else isn't dealing with. That's a really good point. And I think that's a really good point. It, this is where this education mm -hmm. really makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you can understand, oh, I'm not doomed. And it's not that mm -hmm. Stacy over here can do this because she's better than me in some way. It's she's doing it because she doesn't deal with the same things that I have.